good morning. In the last class, we had stopped at uh, uh, point wherein we uh, were introducing ourselves to uh, turbojet engines. Right? We said uh, it was uh, developed during the initial phase of the Second World War. Let us look at how a turbojet engine is. Now, uh, this is the uh, uh, sketch of a turbojet engine. Now, this is the compressor. This is the combustor. This is the turbine. <coughs> this is the afterburner portion. This is the nozzle and here you have the intake or diffuser section. Okay. Now, if you remember in the last class, uh, I had said that uh, while discussing about piston engine uh, propeller combination as we go higher in altitude, we needed to do something known as turbo supercharging and therefore, we had a compressor connected to a turbine and the exit of the compressor was connected to the piston engine. I said uh, the gas turbine engine or the turbojet engine is a evolution from the uh, from this concept to what is seen here. Here we see a compressor and in between a combustor instead of going into a piston engine and then there is a turbine. Now, the turbine develops enough power to run the compressor and this is the afterburner portion and this is the nozzle. Now, let us look at how pressure and temperature vary across the length of the uh, turbojet engine.
now let us first look at uh, pressure. This is the diffuser section. In the diffuser, what happens is the incoming flow is uh, it has a high velocity, its velocities are reduced, and uh, therefore you gain in terms of pressure. The kinetic energy is converted here and you get higher pressure at this point. Now, this is then further compressed in the compressor and you get much higher pressure here. In the combustor, it is a constant pressure process and again you have the turbine where uh, the pressure drops and then in the after burner which is nothing but a second combustor, pressure is again constant and in the nozzle the pressure drops. Let us look at how the line goes. This is how the pressure varies as a function of the length of the uh, turbojet engine. Now, if we look at what happens to temperature, uh, initially in the diffuser portion, temperature again slowly increases because it is undergoing compression and in the compressor again the temperature increases but the temperature increase is not similar to the pressure rise, pressure rise is much much more and in the combustor you are adding heat, you are burning fuel and the fuel uh, plus air is combusted here and therefore, the energy is being supplied, chemical energy is being converted into uh, heat. So, the temperature increases tremendously here. And then in the turbine again temperatures fall because there is an expansion process and in the after burner uh, the temperatures uh, let us now look at a case wherein we have not switched on the after burner. So, the temperature remains constant and again it expands in the nozzle. Okay. Now, we will discuss uh, after burner a little later uh, in the class. Okay. This is how pressure varies, this is how temperature varies. Notice that pressure almost comes back to the ambient pressure at the end of it, whereas temperatures are still very high at the nozzle exhaust. Okay. Now, if we were to convert this information into what is known as a T S diagram. It looks something similar to what you might already be aware of a Brighton cycle. Gas turbine engines or turbojet engines follow Brighton cycle. If on a TS diagram, firstly let us look at ideal processes. Now, I have numbered them 1 to 6, 
I will do the same here too. Uh, this is one end of intake or diffuser section is two, two to three is compressor, three to four is combustor, four to five is turbine, uh, five I will call this point also five because we have not switched on the after burner. So, it is a constant pressure constant uh, temperature process right now and lastly this point as six that is the nozzle exit as six. So, if you look at this diagram here one to two is compression in the uh, diffuser and two to three is compression in the compressor, three to four is uh, temperature rise in the combustor and 4 to 5 is process through the turbine and 5 to 6 through the nozzle. This is an ideal cycle for a uh, turbojet engine. Now, what happens if we uh, look at an actual cycle? What we have assumed here is uh, isentropic compression and and expansion and constant pressure heat addition and rejection. This is what constitutes a uh, Brighton cycle. Now, if you see here, uh, the x axis is uh, entropy, and you see that entropy is constant during the combustion uh, compression process, and entropy is also constant during the expansion process. Uh, this is a constant pressure process. And this is also a constant pressure process. Okay. Now, notice I have uh, wantonly done this that the slope of this line is much more than the slope of this line. This is because if you look at a TS diagram, pressure increases much more steeply at higher values than at lower values, and therefore, the slope of this is much smaller. And this is a dotted line because it does not come back to this position. Okay. Now, <coughs> as I said, we have assumed constant pressure heat addition and uh, heat uh, rejection and isentropic processes. Actual processes, what kind of processes will be they be? Will they be compression, adiabatic, or There is a difference between an uh, isentropic and an adiabatic process. Isentropic process is reversible adiabatic, and adiabatic process is where there is no heat transfer. So, actual processes are without any heat transfer. So, it is uh, typically will be a uh, actual cycle will be will have non isentropic. processes. Okay. So, you will have uh, entropy increasing always. So, you will have 1 to 2 and then 2 to 3. Let me call this new point as 2 dash, this new point as 3 dash. What happens uh, in the com combustor? is the process a constant pressure process. If you are adding heat in the combustor, uh, there is something known as a Rayleigh process, wherein the pressure drops. Okay. So, you will get something like this 4 dash 
and then expansion is again non isentropic so 6 dash this is the uh, typical T s diagram for an actual cycle also. Okay. Now, let us look at what are the typical efficiencies that we get. So, 1 to 2 diffuser the typical efficiencies are this is around 0.6 to 0.9 this depends on the Mach number at which the vehicle is flying. Now, uh, if the vehicle Mach number is lower, you are going to get somewhere higher efficiencies, but as you go to higher Mach numbers, you will get lower efficiencies. And in the compressor, the efficiencies range from 0 0.8 to 0.85 and combustor it is very high around 0 0.972 and 4 to 5 you have <coughs> turbine this is somewhere around 0.87 and lastly 5 to 6 through the nozzle the efficiency is around 0.97. Okay. You will notice that uh, the efficiencies for these two processes are much lower than efficiencies for these two processes. Why do you think that is? Yes. If you take a look at uh, the uh, diffuser or the compressor, in the diffuser and the compressor the pressure is increasing. So, you have what is known as an adverse pressure gradient, whereas uh, if you look at the turbine and the nozzle there is a favorable pressure gradient. Okay. So, therefore, the efficiencies with uh, turbine and nozzle are bound to be higher than efficiencies with diffuser and compressor. Now, let us look at uh, some typical engines. Uh, this is a typical gas turbine engine with axial compressor. Uh, here you have the intake and this is the axial compressor. What we mean by axial compressor is the flow is along the axis and you have the burner or the compressor, then you have the turbine and jet pipe or the after burner and then the nozzle. Okay. Now, uh, this is with a axial compressor as opposed to this you can also have something known as a centrifugal compressor okay, wherein the flow comes in axially and goes out radially and again if you want to have another stage it has to come back in and again go in axially and uh, go out radially and you have the uh, combustion chamber here and then the turbine. So, uh, for a compressor 
we have two choices that is compressor can be either axial or centrifugal what is the difference between the two what what do you think is the uh, change from axial to centrifugal notice one thing that if you take a look at uh, this engine there is only one stage of centrifugal compressor whereas in the axial compressor there are many stages here okay so uh, one is in the axial compressor it has large number of stages and this has fewer stages okay now typically uh, in an axial compressor Uh, the pressure rise per stage is around 1.2 whereas for a centrifugal compressor similar value is somewhere around 8. So, you see that if you want a pressure rise in a centrifugal compressor you can achieve the same with fewer number of stages whereas, if you go for an axial compressor you need large number of stages to achieve the same ok. Now, is that all the difference or is there something more to it? Hmm? Area. Yes. Uh, typically one would uh, most modern engines would go with axial compressors because it requires a smaller frontal area. If you look at the figure here this requires a smaller frontal area compared to this one which has a larger frontal area ok. So, uh, one would go with a smaller frontal area because it reduces drag. So, axial compressors compared to centrifugal compressor ok. Now, if you see here that axial compressor uh, the pressure rise per stage is very small ok. This is because if you go for a larger pressure rise in an axial compressor then flow separation and stall takes place. Therefore, you are forced to look at a very small pressure rise per stage whereas, in a centrifugal compressor you do not have such problems. We will discuss that in detail as when we look at compressors in a lot uh, in a greater detail little later in the course ok. Now, it is also seen that axial compressors will have higher efficiency compared to centrifugal compressors because the flow distribution is much better in axial compressors. If you look at centrifugal compressors, if you need to have multiple stages, then what you have here is flow coming in axially and then it goes out radially and again if you have to have a second stage, it has to come back in axially and then again go out radially. So, 
the flow distribution is not uh, very good in uh, centrifugal compressors. So, therefore, uh, centrifugal compressors will have a slightly lower efficiency. have higher efficiency compared to centrifugal compressors. Okay. Now, we have looked at uh, different kinds of compressors, then you go to the combustor. Here in the compressor, there is temperature rise, typically this temperature will be of the order of 400 to 750 Kelvin. Why am I choosing two different values? One it depends on compressor pressure ratio and two it depends on altitude. At a lower altitude, the incoming air temperature is much higher and therefore, it will rise to a higher temperature, whereas at a higher altitude where the temperatures are much lower, it will rise to a lower temperature. Okay. And in the combustor, we have temperatures ranging from at the outlet of the compressor to so something like 950 to 1600 Kelvin. Okay. Again, uh, it depends on uh, compressor pressure ratio, altitude and also what is known as what is the limit on turbine inlet temperature. Okay. Uh, I will erase the board. Now, if you look at uh, the fuel that is used, what is the fuel that is used in gas turbine engines or turbojet engines? Kerosene. What is the calorific value of the fuel? It's around 42 mega joules per kg. Now, if you are using kerosene, right, the maximum temperature that you can attain with kerosene and air is something like 2300 Kelvin, it is also known as adiabatic flame temperature. So, kerosene is used and it has a uh, uh, heat of combustion of 42 mega joules per kg and what we know as stoichiometric mixture. What do we mean by this? What do we mean by stoichiometric mixture? It is the right amount of fuel and air that is required or it is the amount of air that is required for complete combustion of the fuel. If you use this uh,
for kerosene and air if you use stoichiometric mixture you get a temperature of around 2300 kelvin okay uh, the stoichiometric ratio for this is f which is nothing but mass flow rate of fuel divided by mass flow rate of air this is around 0 0.067 or 1 by 13 for kerosene and air. So, if you have one part of fuel you need 13 parts of air to completely burn it and the temperature that you get uh, at the end of the combustion process is somewhere around 2300 T. And now compare that with what we are letting this go to this is around 1600. Why do you think we are letting not letting it go to such a high temperature? Turbine inlet temperature. Turbine inlet temperatures need to be lower. Uh, why is it to be lower? Structural integrity of the turbine blades. Uh, you have nozzle, you have compressor. Combustor takes that kind of temperature. Why do not you talk about structural integrity there? Because turbine is moving very fast. So, so at a high temperature, it elongates and can rip apart that casing also. Okay. Uh, very nearly there. If we look at this graph here, we see uh, that the uh, strength to weight ratio uh, of any material will decrease uh, rapidly with increase in temperature and in addition uh, turbine blades are spun at very high speeds which contributes to very large centrifugal forces. In addition to this uh, there is uh, something known as creep which is nothing but uh, the tendency of material to deform permanently under the influence of mechanical stresses. Uh, this is caused when you have long term exposure to high levels of stress and is more severe in materials subjected to heating for long periods of time. If you take a look at the compressor uh, sorry the turbine here uh, there are turbine blades and there is an outer casing. Okay. Let me draw that here. Let us say this is the turbine blade and this is the shroud or the outer casing. Uh, there is always a small gap between the two of them. Why do you think it should be there? If you see railway tracks, there is a small gap between two railway tracks. Why is it there? To compensate the elongation due to the heat. Yes. Uh, if you uh, during summer the temperature increases and therefore the gap reduces. Something similar is what you see here. Firstly, the turbine blades are rotated at very high RPMs, so there is an enormous amount of centrifugal force acting on them. Now there is a centrifugal force acting in this direction. In addition to that there are <coughs> thermal stresses that are developed okay. now which lead to elongation of the blade. Now if you do not provide this gap then the blade will rub against the shroud and will uh, deteriorate the performance as well as lead to a shorter life for the turbine blades. But what happens if we give a larger gap? So, what is the big fuss about? Nobody wants to do work just like us the air also does not want to do any work. 
So, if you give a larger gap then the most of the flow tends to go through this because this is the path of least resistance. Okay. So, you cannot give a very large gap because most of it will anyway pass through that you have to give a small gap such that after elongation it is nearly there. right? So, that is why we see that we are not able to go to very high turbine inlet temperatures although our limit is something like 2300 Kelvin we are forced to something like 1600 or 1800 Kelvin. Okay. This is because of the problem that we uh, just now discussed about. Okay. So, if the turbine blades rub on the shroud then it leads to <coughs> lower performance and reduce life of the So, we are forced to compromise and look at a lower temperature. Okay. We are right now at 1600 to 1800 because we use lots of cooling techniques to cool the blades, we use bypass air from the compressor to cool the blades, so that we are able to go to higher and higher temperatures. Okay. Now, lastly you have the nozzle. Here nozzle is the thrust producing device. Just like in the piston engine plus propeller, propeller was the thrust producing device. Here nozzle is the thrust producing device. Okay. If you notice the pressures after expansion in the turbine are very much lower, they will be of the order of around 1.5 to 2.5 atmospheres typically. Okay. This depends again on the altitude and the pressure ratio across the nozzle is very small. Therefore, we typically end up using only a convergent nozzle in an aircraft engine. That is, you only have a convergent portion here, and the reason for that is that the pressures at the exit of the turbine are very much lower, and you do not have a large pressure ratio across the uh, nozzle. So, you end up using a convergent nozzle only. Now, the flow at the end of the nozzle here is choked. What do we mean by that? The Mach number is 1 or the flow attains the speed of uh, flow speed and the acoustic speed are the same. So, So, at the exit of nozzle u e is equal to a which is nothing but speed of sound. Okay. Now, speed of sound is given by where gamma is the ratio of specific heats, R u is the universal gas constant, m is the molecular weight of gases and T is the temperature at the nozzle exit. Okay. So, notice that u e 
is directly dependent on the temperature at the exit of the nozzle T e. So, if the temperature at the exit of the nozzle is large, then you get a higher velocity okay, and therefore, higher thrust. That is what is uh, the reason for this to produce the thrust. You have a higher temperature at the exit and therefore, you get higher velocity. Okay. Now, let us try and look at how to derive the thrust equation. Now, let me call this as the y coordinate and this as my x coordinate and I will assume an engine, I will not look at what are all the details in here, I will look at an engine something like this. will for the time being ignore the details that are inside, because all that it does is it changes flow conditions from here to here. And if we look at what are the changes that it does, we should be able to capture what is the thrust it is producing. Now, let us take a control volume. This is the control volume that I take. <coughs> I have taken the control volume sufficiently upstream of the inlet, because I do not want uh, <coughs> things that are happening here two dimensional effects to come into picture. We are only looking at what is the thrust in the x direction. So, what is the thrust that is produced in the x direction is all that we are interested in. Okay. Now, let me call the parameters at the inlet as rho a, v a, a a and p a. This is rho is density v is velocity a is cross sectional area and p is the pressure Now, similar quantities at the exit section here, let me call this as the intake section I 
and let me call this as the exit section E. At the exit section, similar quantities would be rho E, V E, A E and P E. P E is the pressure at the exit of the nozzle, the ambient pressure is still P A, okay. that is the same as this. <coughs> now, we want to find out what is the thrust that is produced in the x direction. right? So, what do we need to do in order to do this? Which law of motion do we need to look at? Newton's second law of motion, which uh, states that uh, force is equal to rate of change of momentum. So, sigma f x or the sum of the forces in the x direction must be equal to rate of change of momentum. in x direction. Okay. Now, what is sigma f x? What are the things that constitute sigma f x? One is the thrust that it is producing, the other is the pressure into this area and pressure into this area. Okay. So, sigma f x I can write it as f Now, I have taken P A minus P A. If you notice, I have taken the control volume sufficiently upstream, so that the pressure across the intake area does not change much. So, from here to here, there is no change in pressure. So, this will go to 0 and the other one will be in the negative direction, because you are looking at force in the other direction. Now, what is the rate of change of momentum here? M dot into u e, right. So, you have rho e v e square a e minus rho a v a square a a. Rho e v e we know is equal to m dot v e. Okay. So, we get if we simplify further we get f is equal to I take this on the other side and I can write this as m dot a into 1 plus f V e minus V a plus P e minus P a. I have taken this term to the right hand side, this goes to 0. Now, m dot a is nothing but rho a v a. Okay. Now, the 1 plus f constitutes remember in our earlier 
earlier in the class we had defined f as mass flow rate of fuel divided by mass flow rate of air what happens is inside the engine you are adding fuel in the combustor here you are adding fuel right so therefore there is an increase in mass and that is why you have 1 plus f when it is going out there is an increase in mass and that is why you have 1 plus f. So, this is the thrust equation for a turbojet we will discuss uh, more about the turbojet in the next class ok we will stop here we will discuss next about the turbojet in the next class.